Hello, hello, and welcome to the Borealis Experience. I'm delighted to have Kevin Van Tegem with me today. He's a native-born Calgarian naturalist and writer. He published several books in the past decade that are so incredibly inspiring. And I feel he has a big message to share today. We need to protect our headwaters. We need to reconnect to nature. There's more and more people committing suicide. There's more and more people struggling with finances and depression. And we want to give you hope that there is solutions to this recession, to this depression that Alberta, Canada, the world is going through right now. And we want to share with you our thoughts on the future and yeah again give you hope and love and appreciation for mother nature that is constantly supporting us and nurturing us thank you so much for listening also a little disclaimer in the second part of the interview we were sitting together at a distance outside and the wind was blowing quite uh, noisily <laughs> so yeah please don't mind the wind in the background it is not background noise it is mother nature being present with us thanks for listening hello there kevin so nice to have you here today i would love to start out um, this conversation and ask you to explain a little bit on how connected the water is to plants and to the animals around us? Um, well, you know, um, everything is connected in this world. I mean, that's one thing you discover the more time you spend in it. Uh, every, everything you do uh, has an effect on, some, on many other things and everything that uh, happens in nature has multiple effects on us. So um, in Alberta, we are a very water short region um, and we've always valued water. And, and, you know, you were saying earlier that um, Alberta is not full of tree huggers. I'm, I'm not convinced that's true. I just don't think we've ever looked closely enough in the mirror. I, I think we're starting to look in the mirror now that our headwaters are, are, are being threatened by um, proposed coal strip mines. If you, if you look at Alberta as a water short region, um, we use a lot of water. We've got two thirds of Alberta's of Canada's irrigated agriculture in Alberta. That's a real water consumer. Uh, every industry uh, that 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 uh, makes our economy run relies, to one degree or another, on freshwater resources. And yet, we have very small rivers. I mean, if you've been anywhere else in the world, you know what we call a river. Most places would call a creek. Uh, you know, the, the Old Man River, the Bow River, and our southern rivers are the smallest ones, and yet they go to the part of the province that has the most people and the most water demands. So, so water is critical. It's critical to our present, but it's also very critical to our future. You, mm -hmm. you can live without oil. Uh, there are those in Alberta that think you can't, but you can live without oil, but you can't live without water. And you can have an economy without oil, but you mm -hmm. can't have an economy without water. So, if you think about that, then you got to say, well, where does that water come from? What, what, what's, how do we make sure that we will have as much water as we possibly can, given the nature of this place we live in, which is, you know, the lee side of the Rocky Mountains, the part that gets the least moisture. BC gets all the water, you know, that's why they're all green. Um, mm -hmm. We turn brown in July because everything dries out. But all of our water, uh, more, well more than 80% of the water that we rely on for our towns and our communities and our economy and our farms comes from the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, that, that strip of green that you see on the highway map of Alberta running up the west side of the province at an angle because it's following the mountains. That's where mo almost all our water comes from. It comes mostly to us as snow in the winter and also as a lot, you know, usually we get a lot of rain in late May and early Ju Ju June and, and, and that's the other source of water. And, you know, whereas out in the prairies, you know, Calgary, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, east of Red Deer, you don't see a lot of spring rains and you don't get a lot of winter snow. You get a lot in the Rockies. And all that snow melt in the spring and all the rain goes into the ground because it's well vegetated and there's lots of roots providing channels for that water to get into the ground. 
And then it seeps slowly through the ground until it comes out in springs, comes out in the bottoms of rivers and creeks as base flow, uh, sometimes weeks, sometimes months later. And so it, it's, it's this ma marvelous system where we got all this precipitation at this high elevation, beautiful uh, Rocky Mountains strip and the foothills along the edges of the Rockies. We get all this precipitation that goes into a well-vegetated landscape and comes out as clean, cold spring water into trout streams that then come together and become the rivers that support our, our province. So we take that for granted though, like, like we're sitting in the cities or we're sitting out in the farms and we turn on the tap or we fire up the irrigation system or we, uh, uh, we look out the window at the river, maybe go tubing in this on a Saturday afternoon. And it's there, right? We just take it for granted. The water is always going to be there, but it's not always going to be there. It, you only get as much as nature provides and you can waste a lot of what nature provides. And that's what we've done. Um, when water comes to us as groundwater, it's purified and filtered by the ground mm -hmm. and it's slowed down. So we get all that, that, that precipitation in the spring, but we most need water in the summer. That's when we're growing our crops. And then we also need water in those rivers year round because that's how ecosystems stay alive is that they have to stay watered, right? So that groundwater process is wonderful. It gives us good, clean water and it gives us throughout the year. It's a, the perfect storage system. Mother Nature stores most of our water in incredibly beautiful scenery. Mm -hmm. You couldn't ask for anything better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, go there all summer long, enjoy that green landscape, walking on the reservoir that is feeding our economy and our society and our communities. But when you start to muck around with those eastern slopes, that's when everything changes. And we've been mucking around with those eastern slopes for probably 30 or 40 years and created what looks like an industrialized landscape. Mm. Uh, people go up there now and they see roads, they see uh, well sites, they see big clear cuts. And they look at it and they say, well, this is a, a place for, you know, extracting resources. That's obviously what this is all about. They don't see it as a water reservoir. They don't see its incredible function in keeping our water supply secure. They just see what we've done to it. And they think that that defines the landscape. And that's why today we have a government that actually thinks it would be appropriate to strip mine coal from those eastern slopes. Because they look at it and they say, well, you know, it's just another resource. And that's what we do out here. We manage this. But every time you manage those other resources, you're affecting the critical resource, which is water. Mm -hmm. We can live without coal. We can live without uh, trees cut from our eastern slopes. We can live without playing around on motorized vehicles that create big erosion funnels on the landscape. But we can never live without water. Mm -hmm. So that's how it sort of all comes together. Mm. I'm wondering, like, if people knew about this, like, are people being educated um, when it comes to our headwaters and, and water resources? Because I feel, especially people in these big cities, they open up the tap and they just see water ru running all day long. But if they knew how precious it was, then they wouldn't take it as granted. I, I don't want to say that city people are you know, ignorant and, and don't know anything about ecology. But I feel if they knew more about it, they would appreciate it more and destroy less and, and be like totally awake that, yeah, of course, a coal mine is going to create a couple jobs, but it's going to destroy um, our water resource. Did you like? Do you notice that there is a, a lack of communication or misinformation, or 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 do people know about this? Ecological literacy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of us live in our own little bubbles. You know, we're we're all busy. We're all distracted because it's a digital media era, and we're getting bombarded with information and and entertainments and things, and so. So it's really hard to be connected to nature or to be connected to place. Uh, we're just too busy. We're just too distracted. And, um, and, and we also, we're conditioned to take a lot of things for granted. And so that water in the tap is one of those things we take for granted. I think there's a couple, I think a lot of people are waking up, are, are generally aware of the fact that the water comes downstream from the mountains and the foothills. But what they don't understand is the processes that sustain that water supply. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 I really do believe we need to 
um, understand better the nature of the places that we live in because that will makes us more authentically a part of those places, which is good for us culturally, but it also means that we can um, uh, be more attentive and more effective at actually sustaining the things that are important to us. And, and that certainly includes nature, but um, sitting within that is our water security. So that even if you don't care about nature, you've got to have water at some point. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, when it comes to the ecosystem around the rivers, around uh, the headwaters, uh, can you talk a little bit about the animals and the plants, the trees? Um, but also, I think I heard a story about wolves and, and uh, deer mm. um, influencing the water how the water comes down from the mountains and into into the river. Can we talk a little bit about the ecosystem around? Sure. You know, and we talk about riparian ecosystems, and, and those are the ecosystems that are influenced throughout most of the year by the presence of water. So that, so that the little green, you know, after everything in the Alberta foothills turns brown, there's still green strips, and that's the well-watered portions of the landscape. That's the riparian area. Uh, and we think of those as being very biologically important, and they are. Uh, you know, I think like 80% of the plants and animals that are native to this part of the world actually rely on those little green ribbons, those little riparian strips along streams and around ponds and, and, and wetlands. But in reality, the entire landscape is part of the river. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's, the, um, that's the key piece that gives us the, 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 really the solutions to our water issues is to recognize that when we make land use decisions, we are making water decisions and we are actually affecting the health of our streams. And so how, how that works um, is that we get our winter snows and um, the snow lands on the landscape and it accumulates and becomes a snowpack. And that is a reservoir of water. That's actually most of our water. Probably 80% of our water is stored in snow through the winter. Uh, we lose a lot of snow uh, to, to evaporation because it gets trapped in tree canopy and gets whipped away by the, by the wind and things like that. But the snow that goes on the ground is our water supply. Then in the spring, uh, starting at, say, March, depending on the elevation, um, that snow melts. If there's good vegetation, if the ground is covered with vegetation, uh, and uh, and and if uh, there's enough shade to sort of delay the the melting of the of the snow, so if it's got good forest cover, the snow will most of that snow will melt and and se- settle into the ground. It actually soaks in the the vegetation slows its runoff, and holds it long enough to soak into the ground. And then what happens is the snow melt is ending, uh, usually in late May, early June. Uh, we get our peak rains. And by now, the, so- the soil is nice and soft. The, 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 the vegetation's been growing for the spring, so it's been you know, loosening the soil as it builds its roots. And that rain is also able to go into the ground. Some of it runs off, some of it goes in. The more of it that soaks in, the healthier the ecosystem. Because the more of it that soaks in, the, it, the, the more slowly it's released. It, it, it still moves downhill, but it moves downhill underground, where it's got friction, all sorts of things slowing it down. It's getting filtered. And it, when it comes out, it comes out in springs. And those springs are usually at the bottoms of valleys or actually in the bottoms of creeks and rivers. They, they call that base flow. Like, you know, the water in the river, some of it isn't coming from upstream, it's actually coming out of the ground. Mm-hmm. And that's why streams keep getting bigger and bigger without tributaries, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's the good water. That's the best water because it's coming to us year-round, and we need water year-round. It's coming to us clean. It's coming into the rivers cold, which keeps the, the streams healthy for things like trout. Um, and it's not doing any damage. You mm-hmm. know, um, it, it's 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 sweet and clean and 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 sustained. The stuff that runs off is the stuff you got to worry about. Mm-hmm. Some water is always going to run off in the spring, but a lot of it runs off. Um, uh, in the summer too when you've got an unhealthy landscape because if the soil is hardened if the vegetation is being cut or, or disturbed and the soil is hardened um, then water instead of soaking in runs off mm-hmm. and because it runs off it's running off fast because it's fast it's got energy it's picking up dirt so it co- r- doesn't just run off it runs off dirty mm-hmm. it picks up silt that silt is soil it's supposed to stay where it was mm-hmm. uh, it's not doing any good once it's in the stream it just, all it does is it plugs up the, the gravel for the trout and the insects and everything else 
and then it plugs up our reservoirs, and then we wonder why we don't have as much water stored as we used to. Mm -hmm. So all of that's sort of the big picture of why the whole landscape is important. The whole landscape is our water reservoir, mm -hmm. and the underground portion is the most critical part, and the underground portion relies on healthy vegetation and healthy soils. Mm -hmm. And those are the things we damage with bad land use, and certainly with coal mining. Oh, yeah. Like so, big-scale agriculture yeah. and... And coal mining threatening to cut off like coal mountaintops, yeah. where snow cannot accum accumulate now and mm. and melt and run off. And right? it, it basically just just turns the landscape into rubble. Yeah. And, and the rubble does not uh, work well for streams and, and and so so to go back to your wolf thing, um, the reason that the wolf story uh, from Yellowstone is is significant is that when you don't have a lot of predators in the landscape. Um, the grazing animals go to the best forage, and that's the riparian areas, and they and they just camp there. They just keep eating it because it's productive and it's really nutritious. So they just stay there. But air, that kind of attention damages vegetation. Yeah. Um, once there's wolves in the landscape, wolves are 24/7 predators. They're always on the on the lookout. They're always coursing through the landscape looking for prey, and so they make those elk and those deer very nervous, and mm -hmm. and 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 it makes it very unsafe to stay in one spot because now the predators can target you. So they spread out mm -hmm. and, uh, to try and avoid the predators. And that takes the pressure off the riparian areas. Yeah. And that means that their vegetation gets lusher and that means those streams get healthier. Yeah. So okay. it's kind of cool. I mean, everything is connected. Yeah. You know, w whether we have the full suite of animals in the landscape, how we're using the land, how, how, we're, how we choose to conserve, those things all affect each other. Mm. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And we're part of it. We have to stop thinking that... We are outside of it and, and can manipulate and abuse it. We are a part of it, and if we don't take care of it, we will pay the bill uh, a, at the end of the day. Yeah. There's a thing about the power of positive thinking. You know, there's, there's a thing that, uh, about uh, just sort of a body of theory about how one manages one's, say, mental health, which is that you tend to be what you believe you are. Mm -hmm. you, you decide in your mind that you're a certain kind of person and then because you've, you've seen yourself that way you start to model that and in fact you become that kind of person mm -hmm. so you can be as good or as bad as you choose to be yeah. and, and, and that comes to this thing about connections to nature is um, we have got a myth that's come to us from some of the world's great religions that we are separate from nature that we, you know in, in, in the Christian tradition you know we, uh, we had the fall we we were exiled from eden and it's uh, that was basically our isolation from nature mm -hmm. well it, the longer that we buy into that way of thinking about ourselves the more we make ourselves separate from nature and the more we become in, in, in effect orphans from everything that makes us who we are mm. because we are not separate from nature we are totally wired into nature yeah. And everything we do affects it, and everything nature does affects us. And until we can see that we derive our identity from nature, and that we transfer identity onto nature, um, the more that we're going to be in disharmony with it. And, and, and the more we'll create the self-fulfilling pro prophecy that we are separate from nature. And you know what? If you're separate from nature, ultimately you're dead. Mm -hmm. Because nature sustains everything. Yeah. So, you know, it's worth thinking through. Oh, totally. And mental health, like you said, is very much tied into how, how much time do you spend outdoors and in nature? How much do you appreciate the food that you eat? Um, how much do you care about your body? And, and yeah. It, and, and isn't that interesting? Like, yeah. like, like, so why is mental health tied to that? Kind of a, answers itself, doesn't it? Yeah. That's where we get our, that's who we are. Yeah. And if we, if we, if, if somehow we fragment who we are, yeah, there's consequences. Yeah. Mental, physical, yeah. cultural. Yeah, and on my show here, I invite guys that inspire others. Um, and so far, I observe that every, every guy mentions purpose. If you have a purpose, you can get out of addiction. If you have a purpose, if you serve the big picture, if you serve nature or humanity, you can get out of depression. And I feel for you, like you've been such a strong activist here in Alberta and, and so engaged and, and writing one book after the other um, to inspire people and to wake people up. And it gives people 
a purpose. It gives people a sense of living again. And that's what I said at the beginning of the, the episode. I was so disappointed to see that people don't really care about nature here. But through your books and through yeah, me going outside and, and hiking, I meet more and more people who care mm -hmm. about um, Mother Nature. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about your book because I feel that book is also about your observation. Like uh, People are changing for the better. People are realizing and waking up and uh, the stereotype of the oil and gas redneck Alberta person is maybe still present, but there's a, a bigger group, a, a group of uh, wilderness protectors and, and nature friends out there that is growing bigger and bigger. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, I did write, my, uh, my latest book is really focused on that whole idea about creating a different um, different story about what it is to be in Alberta and of Alberta. Um, and, and, and really, the, I did create that contrast between um, uh, the stereotype the world has of us, of the um, angry, entitled redneck in a pickup truck and with a bumper sticker about Trudeau or something like that. You know, I mean, that, that's a stereotype that the world has about us, and to some degree, it's a stereotype that we have about us. It's certainly a stereotype that our premier seems to have about us. Um, and so, again, you are what you say you are. Uh, you create these self-fulfilling prophecies, and, 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 and to see ourselves that way is a very small way of seeing us and, and really limits our potential, mm -hmm. limit, limits our, our potential socially, ecologically, in a bunch of ways. Having said that, it is part of who we are. Um, a lot of us probably fit that category. But that's not all that we are as individuals either. You know, um, you know, sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're frustrated by the fact that we don't control our fate, that, you know, jobs dried up on us and uh, we got responsibilities. I mean, all those things are our issues that we have to deal with, but they don't have to make us just one kind of person. Um, uh, you know, personally, I find that um, if, if you take somebody fishing or hunting or for a hike, it doesn't matter what they're going to have to return to during that period of time. They are um, able to connect with nature and connect with each other in different ways, in more productive ways, and in some ways in ways that inspire solutions to the problems they're going to go home to. So, yeah, um, when you look at Alberta holistically, we are a province of great people, uh, of really connected people. We've got, we've got, uh, um, in spite of everything we threw at them, uh, the, the history threw at them, we've still got First Nations with very strong cultures and very strong connections, and they are engaging now with the rest of society in a way that um, maybe wasn't even possible 20 years ago because of all of the um, the dysfunction on both sides of that equation. Um, we have ranchers and farmers that are now into the third and fourth generation of figuring out how to live on the land. We've got urban people that have, have, have determined that their cities are no longer just going to be, um, uh, you know, um, warehouses for, for human labor, but are actually going to be places to live and create and think in. And, and we've made our cities into beautiful places. I, I remember when I was a kid, like the River Valley in Calgary was just a place where you dumped the old sidewalks and all the industrial lots backed onto the river. And, and that was where they stirred the junk. Like, it, it, nobody saw that riverfront as being um, any part of what was important to Calgary. Mm -hmm. What was important to Calgary was to put our imprint on the land and get rich. Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating it. But now you look around and we've got these beautiful green ribbons of parkland and, and they're full of people out there connecting with their river, with their wildlife, with one another. Um, cities have become places of being. So, so these are all things that are going on while we are um, letting ourselves be limited by this myth that, that it's just about grabbing uh, a bunch of money from underground and using it to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very limited perspective, and it's a perspective that keeps us separate from each other and keeps us separate from the land. It keeps us separate from the future because the future, unfortunately, for Alberta is not an oil and gas future. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you can get all angry angry and indignant when you hear that, but it is simply true. That's where the way the world's going. Uh, like it or not, uh, don't shoot the messenger. Um, this is what's happening. So what does the future involve? Don't worry. We've got the future all around us. We need to just refocus and see it. And the, and the, and the future is our environment. 
is the, are are the uh, are the people that are committed to this place and 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 creating the next economy through through various lines of work that are not just all oil and gas. Um, so that's the conversations we need to have. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard it said that a, 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 I had an instructor once at a management course I took saying, an organization is a product, a product of its conversations. And really a culture is a product of conversations. Mm-hmm. That's what song and music and drama and, and arts are about. They're basically our conversations with ourselves mm-hmm. where we simply try and put poetry into them. Um, so... If that's the case, then we need to have the right conversations. Yeah. Um, we need to have con- conserva- con- con- conversations that expand the, the landscape of possibilities, not that shrink it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I try to do in my book, is to say, here's a whole bunch of different ways to see the place, to admire the place, to, to be inspired by the place, to see one another. And I, I try to stop short of prescribing, uh, prescribing and of saying, and therefore, here's what we need to do. Yeah. But simply saying, let's have these broader conversations and what we need to do will emerge from them. But they will not emerge from a narrow, backward-looking oil and gas uh, will save us yet again. Uh, and if it doesn't, it's somebody else's fault. Yeah. That will not save us. Yeah. No, and this is also something I keep repeating um, with my people on the show and my listeners that we have to become more resilient. Like, we are just, we're putting all our eggs into one basket, and it's good to be committed to something. But if something goes wrong, like now, a couple times, hitting the recession uh, with oil and gas, we are thrown off. So if we become more diverse, if we become more creative, maybe even, then there's less stress on nature but also within ourselves because we know okay if, if one leg breaks off we have three other legs and we're gonna be we're gonna be fine like, right kind of relying on each other again and and yeah creating communities that that support each other and not the individual person who makes the big money and then buys the big house and the big truck that's yeah it's interesting um uh in that vein, um, it's easy to sort of, you know, we talk about the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that at the bottom, you just need to have a house and food. And when you don't have that, don't talk to me about all this other airy fairy stuff, because that's what matters to me. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's true. That's, that really is true. So, so it can be really frustrating to have maybe a conversation like this when you know that your job's going to end next month or end of last month and you've got a mortgage and you've got kids that are in school and the kids are, are stuck at home because there's a pandemic and there's all these things going on, right? Well, at, you know, it's at times like that, it's impossible, really, to imagine the solution. Mm-hmm. Imagine that anything's going to get good again. You think about what it was like to be in Alberta in 1943, in the middle of the war, right? Mm-hmm. You just came out of a depression. All the soils blew away. Everybody's poor. Now all the men are overseas fighting. They're going to come back with PTSD. Meantime, the women are trying to raise kids and, and, and keep the economy going. But the economy's just going, uh, dumping money into the war. 1943, you look in the future, what do you see? You see no hope at all because everything around you tells you there is no hope. In 1984, I was marched into a room with another uh, 30 or 40 people and told that all of our jobs ended in, in, in that coming March. We had a mortgage, 16.5% interest rate, because it was the 1980s, the interest was out of, contr- out of control. The housing market was dropping. We put every penny we had into that house. My wife was pregnant with our first kid. It was bloody awful, uh, because all of a sudden, not only was I going to be unemployed, but I was surrounded with other people who would be unemployed. So was I going to get one of those jobs, or were they? And I was pretty young, right? Um, it was about as dark as it got. And now, it's now... 30 or 40 years later, I look back and I say that was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was sheer hell. I remember the um, walking out of the lawyer's office broke because we had sold the house, signed the papers, and now we were broke because we had to lose money on, on the house to unload it. Uh, and I found a job, but it was at a, only three quarters of the pay of the previous job. At least I found a job. It required us to move. We had money for gas, <laughs> so we could do that. Uh, and that was it. It was like a total restart. 
every assumption that I'd ever had about my life, I'd been actually enrolled in graduate school at the expense of my employer. It was looking so good, and then it just went the other way around, right? Um, and it's really, actually, I would say, in our culture, that's very hard on a man, uh, in, in, in a, the culture I emerged from, because it really was one that were seen as your responsibility um, to support the family and everything like that. And, and, and really, Gail was, at that point, not going to be too employable, because she was and have a baby, right? And, and, and that takes a certain amount of time and focus. Um, so, so that really weighs on you. And so, like I'm saying, uh, you know, I'm just saying this sort of in terms of what you were saying about the people that, you, that you're speaking into with this podcast. Um, at times like that, you know, uh, where is the future? What hope is there? And yet, in retrospect, looking back, that job almost saved me, I think. Is it got us out of Edmonton, which wasn't re- re- actually working for us all that well. Got me started on a new career path, which was actually sustainable. It, it took me into um, some really great jobs in the, uh, in, as the years unfolded. Uh, enabled us to raise our children back in nature rather than in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, was a really good test for Gail and me. It was one of those ones that sort of um, uh, allowed us to grow as a couple. You know, yeah. uh, you either grow or you collapse, right? So, so you know. Um, it's the same thing with Alberta. I mean, the things that happen in our personal lives also happen in our social lives, in our cultural lives, in our community lives. And, and in the case of Alberta right now, we are looking into a future that's really not looking too promising because everything that we've always taken for granted isn't going to be taken for granted anymore. But look at We've got more wind than anybody else in Canada. We've got more sun in southern Alberta than anybody else in Canada. We've got all this beautiful diversity We've got the, uh, the Rocky Mountains and the foothills, the prairies, northern forests, all these things. We've got all the potential to be everything we could possibly be. What we need is different conversations and a different way of seeing ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's really, like I said, that's, that's where I tried to go with Wild Roses are worth it. That's why I tried to go with my previous books. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know whether it's a, con- a, 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 a big contribution or a small contribution, but we all need to be trying to find the way to see ourselves and to see our place differently uh, so that we can start to see possibilities differently that, that, that maybe elude us uh, until we get out of that little uh, stovepipe that we've locked our thinking in about who we are and where we are and expanded it a bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So your latest book is about hope and, and creating more resilience and making people aware of the resources we have and we just have to start using them responsibly and reconnect to nature. Did I understand that right? I think so. I, I thought, um, the, the, my, my, my latest book is, our, like I say, Wild Roses Are Worth It. It's, it sort of rose on an earlier one called Our Place, which are collections of writings. So, so they were never purpose-written to be a book. They were assembled to be a book. Mm. But when you put all these different essays together, and so they, they, you know, they can't span like you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, but you put them together in little bundles, and they, the, the total becomes greater than the sum of the parts, you know, because, it, because they build on each other and, and they reinforce each other. And so there are ways of um, looking at the nature of, of Alberta, like, like, like understanding and seeing and being inspired by just the cool things that are happening out there, the, the way in which animals and plants and seasons and cycles connect with each other and, 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 the, and the, just the miraculous stuff that comes out of that. Like, I, I really do think the world is absolutely full of magic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it's basically saying, so here's some of that. You know? mm-hmm. And then the other piece is just sort of saying, um, here's some of the big issues that confound us. You know, we've got issues around groundwater, we've got issues around oil and gas, we've got issues around predators. And there's, there, there, you know, so let's try and understand those issues a bit better so that we can maybe get to solutions that'll work. And then I think the other thread that turns up here is just talking about great Albertans. There's some wonderful people out there. I've got a big essay on Charlie Russell, who's uh, changed everything mm-hmm. in terms of how, in terms of what we think is possible between us and bears. You know, mm-hmm. well, he's got a fascinating story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I told it, you know. So, so there's all these pieces put together. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when it comes to big decisions, like there was the huge discussion of uh, vaccines and then now with the residential uh, schools, the, the horrifying news coming up, um, 
when it comes to coal mining, when it comes to those big projects where people say, yeah, but it's going to create big jobs, it's going to, our community is going to flourish because so much money is going to flow into our community. Um, what would you, if you had fence sitters sitting in front of you who are still undecided, what would you say to them? Well, I would say to them a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Let's this, keep it this, three. Let's this, say three this, things. This won't be, uh, <laughs> yeah, this, it won't be easy to make short. Yeah. Uh, one of them is in terms of the economic benefits from coal mining. It's interesting that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the communities that are most keen on new coal mines are in the Cozenes Pass, in the Hinton area, Grand Cache area, and these are areas with a history of coal mining. And one of the reasons that they are so eager to see more coal mines is because they are all economically stressed. And the reason they're economically stressed is they built their local economies around coal mining and around the resource industries that boom and bust mm -hmm. as, as commodity cycles change in the economy. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we know with coal mining is that it creates a lot of money, and then it, as soon as the, 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 the price for coal drops, the global, global price, which we don't control, drops, um, the companies abandon everybody. You know, they, 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 um, they groom us. They come into our communities before the coal mines, and they groom us with money, with treats, with new golf courses, new roads, new recreation centers. They, do, they, they spend a lot of money up front to make us like them. They get their approvals, they put in their mines, they send most of their profits overseas, and as soon as the market dries up, they walk away from us. And that's why these communities are so desperate. They want another kick at that cat. Mm. But it's just like Lucy, uh, Lu Lucy in the in the Peanuts uh, cartoons with the football. Uh, every year, Lucy holds the football. Every year, Charlie kicks it. Every year, Lucy pulls it away. How many times do you want to do that before you realize that you are chasing something that's not going to work? So, so don't tell me about economic benefits. Uh, there are economic benefits to leaving the mountains unmined, and those flow to cattle ranchers that run cattle out there. They go to Uh, outfitters and guides and tourism operators, they go to those of us who are trying to make a living in other lines of work but just need to escape once in a while into the mountains. Um, that keeps us here, keeps us from giving up and moving somewhere else. Um, there's lots of economic benefits that come from the landscape. They can come from it, from it in the way of coal, they can come to, it, to us in the way of water, wildlife and fish, uh, cattle, timber. There's lots of ways to sort of extract economic value. The question you need to ask is, wh when you extract this kind of economic value, what are the consequences? Where does it take us? Coal is a dying market. The world is trying to move away from it. Um, again, maybe you don't want to hear that. Maybe you're going to roll, roll your eyes and say that's stupid thinking. Um, yeah, okay, fine. Um, don't shoot me for saying it. I'm just telling you what the world's telling us. And guess what? We market into the world. So we need to pay attention to those messages. Um, one thing we do know is our need for water is not going away, and bituminous coal is in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, the foothills in the Rockies, and that's where all our water comes from. So if it's a choice for our future between water and coal, think it through carefully, because it is that choice. Very, very well said. Thank you so much for making the time and yeah, sharing your thoughts here with us. Um, I will make sure to put your uh, book in the show notes. Okay, thank you. And uh, if people have questions, they can contact you. You have probably, like, yeah, you have a website or on Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on Facebook, and I've got, um, uh, you, you can always um, reach me at kevin.bantigam at gmail.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, very precious, and I'm excited to publish this episode. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you again for listening to my interview with Kevin here. Don't hold back. If you have any questions, reach out to him or to me. There's uh, a big group out there that is, yeah, fighting the good fight <laughs> to protect our precious waters, our creeks and rivers and lakes. And I hope we were able to give you hope and to raise awareness that we need to protect our headwaters at all cost. Thank you for listening, 
and I will be out there very soon again.